This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. We are fragile creatures, and it is from this weakness, not despite it, that we discover the possibility of true joy. I handed the archbishop his sleek black cane with a silver handle shaped like a greyhound. Life is filled with challenges and adversity. Fear is inevitable, as is pain, and eventually death. Take the return of the prostate cancer. Well, it does focus the mind. One of the side effects of the medicine the archbishop was taking is fatigue, and he had slept for most of the flight to India, a beige blanket pulled up over his head. We had planned to talk on the flight, but sleep was most important, and now he was trying to share his thoughts quickly as we approached Dharamsala. We had stopped off in Amritsar for the night so he could rest, and because the airport in Dharamsala was open for only a couple of hours a day. This morning we had visited the famed Harmandir Sahib, the Sikh religion's holiest site. The upper stories are clad in gold, resulting in its popular name, the Golden Temple. There are four doors to get into the Gurdwara, which symbolizes the tradition's openness toward all people and all religions. This seemed like an appropriate place to pay our respects, as we were embarking on an interfaith meeting that would bring two of the world's great religions, Christianity and Buddhism, into deep dialogue. As we were swallowed into a throng of the temple's 100,000 daily visitors, we got the call. The Dalai Lama had decided to meet the archbishop at the airport, a rare honor that he bestows on very few of the endless stream of visiting dignitaries. We were told that he was already on his way. We raced to get out of the temple and back to the airport as we pushed the archbishop in his wheelchair, his bald head covered by an orange handkerchief, a required sign of respect at the temple, which made him look like a dayglow pirate. The van tried to inch its way through the traffic-choked streets of Amritsar as a symphony of car horns played, the mass of cars, pedestrians, bicycles, scooters, and animals all jostling for position. Concrete buildings lined the roads, their rebar sticking out in an always unfinished state of expansion. We finally made it to the airport and on to the plane. We wished that the twenty-minute flight would go even faster, concerned now that the Dalai Lama would be waiting on the tarmac. Discovering more joy does not, I'm sorry to say, save us from the inevitability of hardship and heartbreak. In fact, we may cry more easily, but we will laugh more easily, too. Perhaps we are just more alive. Yet as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We have hardship without becoming hard. We have heartbreak without being broken. I had witnessed both the archbishop's tears and his laughter so many times. Well, more his laughter than his tears, in truth. But he does cry easily and often for that which is not yet redeemed, for that which is not yet whole. It all matters to him. It all affects him deeply. His prayers, in which I have been enveloped, reach around the world to all who are in need and suffering. One of his book editors had a grandson who was ill and on the archbishop's very long daily prayer list. Several years later, the editor asked if he would once again pray for his grandson because the child's illness had returned. The archbishop replied that he had never stopped praying for the boy. From the plain we could see the snow-covered mountains that are the postcard backdrop to the Dalai Lama's home in exile. After the Chinese invasion of Tibet, the Dalai Lama and a hundred thousand other Tibetans fled to India. These refugees were temporarily settled in the lowlands of India, where the heat and mosquitoes led a great many to become ill. Eventually the government of India established the Dalai Lama's residence in Dharamsala, and the Dalai Lama was very grateful for the higher altitude and the cooler weather. Over time, many Tibetans came to settle here as well, as if the community was heartsick for the mountainous landscape and high altitude of their home. And of course, most of all, they wanted to be close to their spiritual and political leader.
Dharamsala is in the northern Indian state of Himachal Pradesh, and the British, when they ruled India, also used to come here to escape the relentless heat of the Indian summer. As we approached this former British hill station, we could see the green carpet of pine trees and agricultural fields below. Dense storm clouds and fog often closed the small airport, as it did on my last visit. But today the sky was blue, the wisps of clouds held at bay by the mountains. We descended for the steep landing.